What's up, guys? It's your host, Hao Tran here, the CEO of Vietcetra, and of course, your ever-present host for the Vietnam Innovators English edition. Of course, for those of you that are listening that may not be aware, we have a Vietnamese edition recently released that's hosted by our chief operating officer, Ruby Nguyen, and that one's in Vietnamese language. So do look out for that one. Of course, uh, this is our English edition, and we're welcoming guests from all around the world that happen to live here in Vietnam and are innovating in their industries. Doesn't have to necessarily be just technology. We've been uh, kind of interviewed people in banking and financial services, uh, design, and of course today we're focused on a very interesting story that uh, originated elsewhere, but it has kind of found its roots and is at scale here in Vietnam, or about to be at scale, and we'll let him explain himself. His name is Jack O'Sullivan. He's the co-founder founder CEO of Modmo. Um, it's an electric bike company. Um, I'll kind of l let him fill the blanks himself. Um, Jack, welcome to the show today, this afternoon, to the radio room as well here in Ho Chi Minh City. Welcome. Yeah, thanks very much for having me. Glad to be back and on the podcast. Yes, and it's uh, it's been probably a year or two since uh, Jack and I first met. Yeah. Um, maybe, a, no, yeah, a year since we first met. And I probably saw you probably three or four months ago, but it's always at these events and other things. So, you know, we haven't uh, caught up necessarily too much about each other's businesses. So today is an opportunity to do that. Um, I'm just going to jump into today's kind of questions. I've got a number that I've created myself, but also some from our readership, which I'll also share with you. Cool. Um, we recorded their questions and we'll be playing them in a little bit. Um, the first question, kind of nice and tight for you, is, is why Vietnam? And, and why now? Yeah, so originally what attracted me here was the free trade agreements with Europe. You know, like traditionally all the bike manufacturing is in China and Taiwan, mm. but they had pretty hefty tariffs for importing into Europe. So I saw the European Vietnam free trade agreement was in discussions and basically came here to check out a factory, like loved it and decided to go all in on Vietnam. And then Yeah, luckily about a year ago, I guess, that was ratified and yeah, came into effect. So I guess that's what brought me here. But then it was the people that I met that kept me here. Like uh, coming here was just to find a factory where we could outsource our production. And then I really liked Vietnam. I was mm. like, hey, I'd rather live here than living back in Ireland. Mm. And then, you know, extended a holiday and then hired my first guy part time. Like he's now our, our lead engineer and probably has a team of yeah, 10 or 15 people now. So yeah, we've been able to find a lot of great talent here and like build the entire business around it. So, so when, you, when you first came here, you were imagining, okay, we'll build a production team in Vietnam, a factory, and, uh, or find a factory partner, I guess. And then you would go back to Ireland, which is where your sales and marketing and branding efforts are. But now everything's here. Yeah. The entire team yeah. or most of the team. Um, yeah, exactly. Yeah. And I guess COVID has been a big part of that, right? Mm -hmm. Like mm -hmm. it would have been difficult to move home after seeing like how the two different countries sure. like manage things. Um, it's been like a year now for you, a little more than that. Yeah, I think it's been like exactly a year since we launched. Mm -hmm. So we have this kind of crazy story that it was, we didn't really start the business with a lot of money. Mm -hmm. um, and we basically had this 3D render. We put it out and we got some media features, like including the et cetera. And like, yeah, basically all this German media started featuring us and we got a lot of pre-sales on our bike and we've been able to build the entire product and a team of like 25 people now here in Vietnam. Mm. So it's kind of wasn't, we never had this like great big business plan that nailed all this stuff down, but mm -hmm. it just happened organically. And maybe you can talk about that free trade agreement thing too. And Uh, of the diplomatic community that's listening to this, they're probably very pleased that you're mentioning it today. Um, you mentioned that the tariffs are much friendlier than Taiwan or, or China or probably other parts in the world. Yeah. Maybe you can paint a picture of what that looks like exactly. Are you paying 0% tax when you're exporting? Is it 2%? Is it 5%? And what is the difference in cost when you compare it to other manufacturing hubs mm -hmm. uh, around the world? Yeah, so I guess don't quote me on this because the tariffs change a lot. Yes. And yeah. it depends on several factors. But um, so previously when we'd imported from China, we were paying like a 68% tariff on bikes. Mm -hmm. Taiwan was then 15% and Vietnam anywhere between like two and a half and 6% at the moment. Mm -hmm. And that will go down to zero over the next couple of years. Wow. And that covers Europe. 
Yeah. Okay. Yeah, but there's 17 free trade agreements that Vietnam's part of. Mm. So countries like Canada, Mexico, um, Australia, quite a few. And I think, is there some talks for the US? I know like mm -hmm. e-bikes have some um, exemptions in some countries. So mm -hmm. yeah, it's just like, it's hard to compete with a better country for producing e-bikes in terms of like tariffs. Excellent. And you guys are selling mostly into Europe, but you have global ambitions, it sounds like. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, cool. I think 95% of our sales are into Europe at the moment. Excellent. And and we'll hear more about those kind of sales figures and, and what the strategy is a little bit later in this podcast. Mm -hmm. um, my next question for you is, is the assumptions you made. Obviously, you're doing a lot of research and you've identified Vietnam as capable of manufacturing these bikes, at least uh, on paper mm -hmm. or in the phone calls you've had, as well as having these uh, very friendly tariff agreements. Um, what were some assumptions you made before arriving or even other milestones, such as like going into mass production uh, that you made that you found later to be correct or incorrect? Yeah, so I guess with most of the bikes, traditionally made in China or Taiwan, it's really easy to find parts there. You can go, you can just find factories by like Google or Alibaba or stuff like that. Mm. You search, search in like bike tire and you've got a list of them to go through. Yeah, not the same in Vietnam. Mm. And basically we found through like the year that all those factories are there, but they're not like listed anywhere. The only way to find them is through like contacts mm. and going to events and like people just mentioning it to you. Wow. Really like, so like, I think one of the best things Chinese manufacturing is going for it is Alibaba, right? Mm -hmm. Which is this global trading website and you can literally find anything there. Vietnam doesn't have that. Does it, I mean, that was when you first were researching about the market, has it changed since then? There's still no marketplace or database or anything like no. that. Okay, interesting. So we're sure. still like, even what we look at is like the export certificates, right? So which companies are exporting say electric bike batteries? And our guys were researching that and they couldn't find anything. And then it's just over time, these big factories reach out to us. Mm -hmm. And we're like, oh, you guys are just down the road? Like we never knew that, which is kind of crazy. Why do you think that's never been the case? Do people like to hide their suppliers? They don't want yeah. to be too sherry, I guess. Yeah, or... I mean like brands definitely hide their suppliers, but mm. a lot of these big high-tech factories are set up by their Chinese or Taiwanese mm. parent companies. And they don't advertise that that they're manufacturing in Vietnam. It's, it's almost like a subcontractor or something like that. Exactly. Okay. That's exactly it. Is there an emergence of Vietnamese manufacturers that are not tied to those though? I'm sure there are, but yeah. maybe there's not enough, maybe. Yeah, that's it. And like a lot of these factories need like huge investments, mm. which I think whereas Vietnam is lacking a little bit. Is that going to change with the free trade agreement and the the surgent resurgence of not resurgence, but rather emergence of um people moving manufacturing to Vietnam, do you think it's going to sure. happen? Yep. And that's why these Chinese companies are here. Cool. Literally because of, say, the tariffs that Trump imposed on them, they mm. set up here really quickly. And like, even more so that will happen with these European manufacturers. They'll set up here in Vietnam. Interesting. So we've been like very lucky to get in early to Vietnam mm. and being able to work with these like huge factories that are producing for the top automotive brands in the world, yet they're willing to work with us because you know, e-bikes represents like a new and growing division, mm. but we're not competing with say Trek or Specialized, these big conglomerate e-bike brands, mm. you know, so. Fascinating, yeah, great. Well, I don't know if you actually noticed, but I was, uh, we make a habit of sharing to our listeners and our, our readers on Vietcetera that, oh, hey, we're expecting these guests on the show. Um, I shared on my LinkedIn and a few others. And we got a huge response from our readership base, especially those not just from within Vietnam, but outside. And we've got a number of those questions that we're going to share with you today. We got, I think, 50. Right. Uh, but right. we're only sharing two because <laughs> today's podcast is only about 45 minutes. We're going to play the first one here. Hi, Jack. Uh, looking ahead, what are some initiatives that Matmo is focusing on aside from ramping up production? So that's a pretty broad question. I'll let you kind of interpret it yourself, um, but we'd love to hear what's the future hold for Monmo. Yeah, so I think two different sides of that. One would be our like sustainable manufacturing. And um, one thing we implemented pretty early was that we asked our suppliers to never ship us any products in single use plastics. So according to like this year's production forecasts, that would uh, create about 50,000 plastic bags per month. And we designed reusable packaging that we just send to our suppliers and they ship us out the product in, just kind of keeps going in a loop. So, you know, that actually has a huge 
effect on like what's being produced and it's pretty easy ch change for us to make. Um, another thing we're working on is like tech development. Mm. Uh, I'm pretty sure we could like build a rocket ship in our company these days <laughs> with the amount of like engineers. Um, it's like pretty impressive the stuff we can do in-house now. So we've got some like pretty cool products that you've definitely never seen in a bicycle before uh, coming out on our bike soon. Excellent. So without going into too much detail, yeah. Um, yeah, we're really going to be like a bike tech company rather than just making bikes. Fascinating. And yeah. uh, that talent that you keep refer referencing to, mm -hmm. you're obviously very proud of the team you've built. Yeah. Um, are they all Vietnamese? Are they, for the most part at least? Yeah, yeah really? exactly. 95% wow. okay. um, Vietnamese. Mm -hmm. Uh, there's a lot of hidden talent here, you know, mm. especially when it comes to like developers. Are, are they younger? Are they older? Like, tell us about the backgrounds maybe a little bit. Yeah, pretty young. I mean, a lot of them working for like these IoT companies and say like the, some of the Vietnamese kind of conglomerates mm -hmm. designing smartphones or mm. uh, electric motorbikes. So, yeah, I guess some of them have left their current jobs because they feel like they're lost in these big companies and mm. would rather have a more direct impact here because... Mm -hmm. You know, um, we don't take too long to make decisions and we're, you know, usually moving pretty quick. So I guess, yeah, I think it's worked really well. Mm -hmm. I've always put an emphasis on people who are, you know, ambitious rather than people who have big backgrounds. Because mm. I'm sure, you know, in a startup, a lot of it is like, how much can you get done in this very short amount of time? And mm -hmm. going home at 6 p.m. doesn't work, mm -hmm. especially when you're working to these deadlines. So um, yeah, that's worked out well. Excellent. That's great to hear. Um, we have a second reader question that we're going to play now. Um, so our producer is going to show it. Hi, Jack. I have a question for you. Is the domestic market a focus for you at all? Or why or why not? You're great. You know, you talk about exports and the free trade agreement. Obviously, you guys are in a good position to capitalize on that, not just for taxes, but the consumer base just knows mm -hmm. what electric bikes are all about. Vietnam, uh, maybe you can share a little bit about that. Yeah, I mean, like, we definitely see big potential in the market here. I don't think it's as developed as, like, Europe, because people generally cycle everywhere in Europe. Um, but, like, we do see a huge amount of interest, and we've been in discussions for quite a while now with a large uh, motorbike distributor here in Vietnam. Mm -hmm. So I can't share details just yet, but you can expect there to be Modmo showrooms in Saigon, Da Nang, Hanoi. Um, and certainly like delivering anywhere throughout the country like pretty soon. Mm. Um, but again, it's a slightly different market to what we're used to. We, we just communicated in English. Mm -hmm. So we're going to be starting separate channels to work directly with the Vietnamese. Uh, we've started doing things like test ride events, um, which we hope to run monthly from our office in Thao Dien. Um, yeah, just like roadshows and stuff like, mm -hmm. you know, the team really love getting involved with the like direct communication with their customers, mm -hmm. which they don't usually get. Yeah. And you get so much good product feedback from that mm -hmm. as well as like building up the connections uh, being able to bring suppliers in like for sure. Vietnam definitely has big potential. And, and would you say that move to, 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 to open up and distribute in Vietnam, was that a move that you made because of COVID or was it something always on your roadmap as in, when I say COVID too, obviously you can't travel abroad, right? You can't go visit your customers in Europe unless you have a team over there already. Um, was it more of a, a reactive or more proactive kind of um, program mm -hmm. that you put in place? Yeah, I guess it certainly wasn't in the original roadmap. Mm -hmm. I guess because I would have thought the price point was too high. Mm -hmm. You know, selling a bicycle for three thousand mm -hmm. dollars is a lot. Mm -hmm. You might see probably in the comments of this video, it's going to be like. Oh my God, that bike is so expensive. Mm. We get a lot of that. But then in real life, we can be out on the street and some guy's like, hey, I like that bike. And he's like, oh, I'm going to buy one. And he'll mm. buy one on the spot. Mm. So there's certainly still a big market that like want them and can afford them and, you know, really want that lifestyle of, you know, riding electric bikes and stuff. So um, it's not going to be mass market. It's not mm. going to be for everyone. But yeah, people, people do like them. Excellent. Well, we're looking forward to more Modmo, hopefully bikes on the road in Saigon very soon. Yeah. Um, so that kind of wraps up our, our listener questions. We can't play too many. I've got more questions, so mm -hmm. I, I got to prioritize myself a little bit here. Um, my next question for you, Jack, is um, you, know, you talk about manufacturing and how you've been able to find uh, suppliers in Vietnam. Um, my question for you is, are there any missing gaps in that process in Vietnam? And have you had to like 
bring in parts from overseas to, to kind of complete the whole process. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so if I get into a little bit of detail, so mm -hmm. the first production run had 42% made in Vietnam bikes. Mm -hmm. We're thinking within the next, say, three months, we're going to be up to about 70%. Mm -hmm. And then my target is to get to like 90% made in Vietnam. As and in the parts itself or the bike? Well, you know, like, so there's 47 components on bike. Right. Okay. So 42% of those is I see, I see. made in Vietnam. So you're assembling everything here. Yeah. But, and you're bringing parts in. From exactly. Yeah. Okay. So the main parts are still made here, but mm. say things like branded components. So like the brakes, right? Maybe, mm. you know, Shimano and stuff. We don't use them, but we, they don't make them here. So we can't mm. do that. But, you know, we're investing a lot in our manufacturing. Mm -hmm. Like a lot of it, we have acquired the talent to can produce it. It's mm -hmm. just making a big investment in molds and, you know, the non-sexy parts like mm -hmm. that, you know, mm -hmm. it's uh, manufacturing, but yeah, you know, COVID has brought on all these like huge supply chain issues. Mm -hmm. You know, we used to, it used to take say two months to produce a part and then it shot up to a year in wow. the space of like a week. So our whole world was turned upside down back mm -hmm. in September and we've been like massively lucky in a way to be in Vietnam because a lot of the core suppliers here weren't affected um, because there's not a huge bike industry here and also that COVID didn't affect it as bad. So that's like really caused us to double down on Vietnamese manufacturing. Excellent. And has it kind of met your expectations? So have you had any issues with quality control or process? Uh, like not so much because we it, it'll, it, requires a lot more involvement. Mm. So basically the production team is becoming one of the largest divisions in Modmo. Um, so we would have people on the ground in the factories while they're producing to make sure everything's done all right. Uh, you know, the issues we've had had, I would put down to our own fault and like not having created the right standard operating procedures and training their staff how to do it. But in terms of like the abilities, absolutely, the cost is solid um so it's, it's just a learning curve and like yeah be fully confident that we'll be able to do everything here excellent will we see a monmo factory in the future hopefully if, if things progress for sure we'll see we'll see very likely excellent um my, my last question for you jack is um uh kind of the bike itself as a solution um i don't know too much about biking to be honest and and our listeners may or may not either um, I'm sure there are some that are very savvy that are watching this video as well. What kind of challenges are you solving with this solution? Is it is it societal? Is it more functional? Is it maybe you can describe um, the kind of customer that would think about buying this this bike? Yeah, so I guess I originally designed it for myself, right? So living in Ireland, maybe 30, 40 minutes from the city and just like hating commuting to work, sitting in the traffic. Like uh, I was a big cyclist, but bikes had these kind of core issues that I wanted to address. You know, like cycling to work, you're gonna get there and be all sweaty. If you bring a bag on your back, your back's gonna be all sweaty and you can't carry so much. And like also I had like two bikes stolen within a couple of months. Mm. So these were like some of the things that I wanted to fix. Um, so that's why we yeah, developed the Modmo e-bike, which is obviously electric. We've got a really big battery range that can do like 200 kilometers per charge. It's also removable, so if you're living in a flat, you can take out the battery, plug it in oh, inside. Okay. Um, we did bring a new concept of bikes as well, so it's modular. So we have all these accessories like a basket, trailer, baby seat, like anything like that, and they just clip on, no tools, so make it a lot more adaptable to your lifestyle. If you're going to the supermarket to do your grocery shopping, you know, you clip on a trailer and you can carry anything. Um, so that was it to make a, give it a lot more utility than a standard bike. Um, and then, yeah, the third part was like making it smart. So step one was building in a Bluetooth and GPS sensor. We've got a Modmo app that will show you, you know, all your routes. If your bike's stolen, it will give you a notification. Mm -hmm. Um, shows your, yeah, your battery, um, battery capacity. And it sounds like a lot of the products you're integrating into this is somehow making it more appealing to a broader base yeah. as well. Because um, I think of myself as a bike. I mean, it's not the most functional for me living in, in where I have in the world just because, uh, you know, the stealing issue or, or maybe um, where I live is really hot and it just doesn't make sense to bike to work because yeah. I'll show up sweaty or something like that. Um, it's in a way creating its own market, hopefully. 
not yeah. just tapping these existing ones. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Right. It is a different like customer base. It mm-hmm. is like these people living in cities who are just like, and with COVID, obviously, mm-hmm. people who used to use public transport don't want to do that anymore. Mm. If you don't want to buy a car, yeah. an e-bike is a pretty solid choice. Oh, excellent. Yeah. And, and do you mind sharing like some sales figures, high level even objectives, and maybe what you've done so far in terms of, of traction? Yeah. So we did just over a million euro in pre-sales mm-hmm. uh, last year. Um, just under a thousand bikes were pre-ordered. Okay. Um, so yeah, we're like trying to get through the backlog of them, mm. wrapping up our production. You're, you're shipping them out already though too. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, we did our first shipment the day before Ted. Oh, we got excellent. It out through customs. Is so it, has it arrived at its destination? It, yeah, probably by the time this podcast is live. Oh, excellent. Uh, yeah, so okay. mid-March, like towards okay. the end of March, they're going to land cool, in cool, Germany. Cool. Mm. So like 86% of our sales are in Germany. Mm. Um, yeah, big customer base there. And Excellent. We just kind of announced uh, we've got four different test ride locations, mm-hmm. aiming to have 40 test ride locations by the end of this year, um, aiming to produce a little over 4,000 bikes this year as well. So, yeah, um, big, big growth, I think. Um, production is obviously the challenge, challenge here, mm-hmm. especially with the supply chain, but hmm. pretty confident we'll get there. Yeah. Excellent. We'll hope to see thousands, if not tens of thousands of Modbo bikes on the road soon, and That's hopefully cool. here in Vietnam. Yeah, uh, Jack, that kind of wraps up our podcast today. Uh, we're keeping it nice and tidy around 30, 35 minutes today. So thank you for joining, of course, for another episode of Vietnam Innovators. Uh, before we let you go, um, do you have any other maybe comments or thoughts you might want to share with our audience about Monmo, the electric bike? Uh, maybe a nice little plug for recruitment, whatever you'd like yeah, to share. Yeah, let's just think of that like we are hiring. Um, a lot of engineering, mm. um, also building up the marketing team here in Vietnam, doing mm. some interesting things, um, without going into too much detail. Yeah. Some, uh, videography, writing, um, content creation stuff, uh, a lot around that. Um, and yeah, mechanical, electrical, IOT engineers for sure. Developers, Android, iOS. Yeah. That um, sounds like a lot. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you don't actually find so many details about the jobs we're hiring for on our website, but mm. uh, a place like Career Builder, mm-hmm. that's where we advertise. Mm-hmm. If not, just jobs at modmo.io. Mm-hmm. Hit us up there. If you're interesting and like, really the one thing I look for is like, if you're passionate about the product we make, mm. that's what I want to hear. Tell me your ideas, how you would improve our product. And like, yeah, you'll get an interview. Excellent. Cool. So Modmo, it's based here in Ho Chi Minh City, hiring for yeah. all types of teams. Jack, again, thank you for joining the show, and we hope to welcome you back soon. And good luck to the Monmo team, and and yeah, to the to the many bike riders or and future bike riders that are considering your product. Thank Cheers. you again. Cheers! Yeah, thanks very much, and looking f- yeah, looking forward to being on again next time next year. Take care. Cheers. You can find the full audio of this episode of Vietnam Innovators on Spotify and Apple Podcast. Don't forget to subscribe and tune in every Tuesday morning to listen to other innovating stories of our guest speakers. Thanks for listening to another episode of Vietnam Innovators, brought to you by our partners, health tech startup GeoHealth. They're best known for their doctor at home services, but offer much more than that. If you haven't already, check out their mobile apps on the App Store and Google Play for more or drop by for a visit to their new smart clinic at M Plaza in Ho Chi Minh City.